Good day. Today, 14th August 2024, we can look back on a previous 24 hours in the fighting in Ukraine, which has been marked by quite a lot of activity, though none so far, as far as I can tell, that is of any immediately decisive nature. However, that may change at some point over the next few days. Now, briefly, we've had more Ukrainian attacks of various sorts in the Zaporozhye area, south of Orekhov, towards that town of Rabotino, small village of Rabotino, which has been contested for weeks now. Ukraine still has failed to capture Rabotino. These appear to have been less intense attacks than those we have normally seen, some of the attacks we have seen. And anyway, they don't seem to have changed the situation there in any respect. The same continues to be true further west at the village of Piatikhatki, the area uh, of Piatikhatki near the Dnieper River, the far western end of the southern front lines. Again, the situation appears to be stable and essentially unchanged. We are continuing to see and get lots of reports of intense fighting in the Vremevka, Vremevka uh, salient area for the capture of this bitterly contested village of Urajainoye. Now, yesterday, the couple, about two days ago, Ukraine launched a major attack trying to capture this village, and uh, which is the next village along the winding road from Staromayorsk, which, by the way, remains in the grey zone. It's been flattened. Ukraine has not been able to occupy this village. <coughs> but Ukraine has been able to use the fact that the Russians have been driven out of Staromayorsk to launch intense attacks to capture Urojainoye. Now, can I say that that is the point at which the consensus of reports from both sides come to a stop? Because what has happened next depends entirely on whom you believe as reporting the fighting for this village correctly. Now, there was, and this is generally conceded by both sides, a major Ukrainian attack to capture Urojainoye a few, two days ago. Um, the Russians claimed that the Ukrainians only managed to capture an area in the north of the village. There are reports from the Russian side that over the course of last night, some Russian troops, around 70 of them, from a unit called the Kaskad Force, from what I can understand, this is a militia unit rather than part of the Russian regular army. Anyway, <coughs> according to the Russians, <coughs> this unit was pulled out, but the Russians remain, as of this morning, in control of the southern part of this village. And there are even reports from the Russians that they are preparing to counterattack and drive the Ukrainians out of this village completely and then establish new defence lines, stronger defence lines, perhaps beyond the pressings of the village itself. Now, Ukrainian reports tell a different story they speak of Ukraine having actually fully captured this village of Urajainaya. Now, I said that the Ukrainians made a big attack trying to capture this village. Um, I think perhaps to get a sense of context, it's perhaps useful to say that um, Riba, not perhaps a reporter or commentator that everybody takes especially kindly to, but he has spoken of one particular Ukrainian attack on Urajainoye, very 
strong attack from some of the descriptions. Anyway, he says that the Ukrainian force that attacked Orajainoye numbered around 100 men. In other words, it was about a company of troops. I said that the report spoke of 70 Russian troops from this Kaskad force <clears throat> having been pulled out of Urajainoi last night. Last night. That gives us perhaps a sense of how important this particular village is. We're talking about battles between scores of soldiers on East side, not hundreds and certainly not thousands, and this over the course of a conflict where the armies on each side number hundreds of thousands. Now, I don't want to appear to discount entirely the scale or intensity of the fighting for this particular village, but I would repeat again, even if the Ukrainians manage to capture Urajainoye, or even if they have actually done so. It is a small village in one part of the battlefronts. It is actually, and I have to correct something that I've said in previous videos, I've suggested that it is actually close to the main Russian fortified lines, the Surovikin line, but it turns out that is not quite correct. The Surovikin line is still some distance to the way away in the, to the south and east, and beyond that, there are apparently other settlements and even a small town between the Ukrainian forces and the Surovikin line. So it's a bitterly fought fight for this particular village. It's not an unimportant fight. What it illustrates, regardless of who now controls this particular village, is how difficult it is for Ukraine to advance and to capture even a small village like this in an offensive which is supposed to battle through layers of Russian defences and fortifications all the way to the Sea of Azov. Now, can I just say, before I proceed, I mentioned that it's the Kaskad force that has been pulled back. <clears throat> there are reports that, in fact, they've been replaced by other Russian troops drawn from a, a marine brigade, a Russian marine brigade. As a matter of fact, most of the Ukrainian fighters, soldiers in this area, are drawn from the Ukrainian Marine Force, which is fully committed to this battle in the Vremovka salient. <clears throat> but now Russian Marines are apparently coming into battle, so it'll be a case of Marine versus Marine, Russian Marines fighting Ukrainian Marines. But there is also reports that other Russian troops in this area Call, come from an entity, a, a grouping, called Assault Group Z, or Assault Group Z, if you prefer the American uh, pronunciation of that letter. Now, I have, I've seen references to this Assault Group Z, or Z, and in fact, I, just, I gained the impression that there is more than one of these groupings operating on the Russian side. From what I can understand, these are volunteers. And from what I've also been under able to understand, these are actually ex-convicts. So these are people who have volunteered to join the fighting from Russian prisons, from the Russian prison system. Now, about that, I might be wrong, but that's what I understand these people are. Now, they are not subordinate to the Wagner organisation. They have nothing, apparently, to do with the Wagner organisation. They're supervised <clears throat> by the Russian regular army, and all reports suggest 
that the army is much more careful in their use than the Wagner organization was, which by all accounts was very profligate with the lives of its, con its convict volunteers, many of whom were sent into the fighting in Bakhmut with minimal training. This is not the case with these troops that form Special Assault Group Z or Z. Now, I want to stress, this is my understanding. I am not able, I'm not absolutely certain that this is the position. Um, others who might know, perhaps some um, viewers from Russia who might be more familiar with this particular unit or this particular grouping, perhaps can clarify who they are and what they're doing, but it does seem that they are, whoever they are, pretty tough and formidable fighters. Now, as I said, I want to stress, I'm not present in this battle. I'm not physically able to say who is telling the truth and who is not about the situation in Urajainaya. I will again reiterate that this is hardly a battle of great significance, this village is not as important as some people would imply or suggest, and the fighting that is taking place with control of it is on a relatively limited scale. We're not talking about fighting on the same scale as what we have witnessed, for example, earlier this year take place in Bakhmut when tens of thousands of men were fighting each other and tens of thousands of men died or wounded or got wounded in that grim battle. So this is a different sort of battle to that. I will offer my tuppence worth, and this is just my surmise. It is not my uh, knowledge of the fact. I think that the Ukrainians did at one point manage to capture the entire village. I think that the Kaskad forces, when they withdrew, or 70 of them, did in effect cede entire con control of the village to the Ukrainians. I think, however, that shortly after the Russians counterattacked, and this is why the Marines and this special assault group Z has now entered the southern sections of the village, and it is possible that we will be seeing more counterattacks in this area from the Russians over the next few days. Though I want to stress, I doubt that the Russian plan long term is to try to maintain control of the village. Russian tactics are not to hold on, to cling on to villages like this. It is to slow Ukraine's offensive down and to inflict <clears throat> as much attrition on the Ukrainian forces that are undertaking this offensive as possible, whilst conserving the lives of Russian soldiers whenever that is possible. Also, with a view to eventually ending the momentum of this offensive, in other words, blunting it before it even reaches the Surovikin line, let alone manages to advance beyond the Surovikin line towards places like Mariupol, as would be the case here. So I think this is the Russian plan. It's not, as I said, to retake and hold on to this village. It is to cause as much complication and confusion and disorganization to this Ukrainian offensive as we have seen everywhere else. And we've already seen how this tactic appears to have had some success in the Bakhmut area. Now, again, I want to uh, stress that I'm not directly there on the scene. I'm not able to say exactly what is going on, whether in the Bakhmut area or anywhere else in the battle, but there is now an increasing consensus from um, Russian reports that um, the Russians have 
basically blunted Ukraine's offensive in the Bakhmut area and that they've managed to push the Ukrainians back in places. We're not, to be very clear, talking about a major Russian counter-offensive in and around Bakhmut. It's more that the Russians have pushed the Ukrainians back, blunted the Ukrainian offensive towards Bakhmut, Artyomovsk, as the Russians now called it, essentially fought the Ukrainians to a standstill and caused severe attrition to their forces to the point where the momentum of the Ukrainian offensive in and around Bakhmut has basically ebbed away. Now, I took a report from Riba um, to describe the fighting in the Vremevka Ledge and Urajai Noye. Um, since I started with Riba, I will continue with Riba. He's provided an account of the latest fighting in the Bakhmut area. As I said, he has his perspective. He's obviously pro-Russian. He's often criticised by Russian commentators for being excessively pessimistic about um, Russian actions. That's become less so in the last couple of weeks, incidentally. He's become increasingly more optimistic as, from a Russian perspective as the Russian, Russians have become increasingly successful countering Ukraine's offensive actions. Where I think he falls down, and which where I think a lot of the criticisms of him are made and which are justified, is that he doesn't always confine himself to just reporting what has happened and providing the occasional analysis of it. He also provides lots of reports about Ukrainian troop movements behind the Ukrainian front lines, and he engages in predictions about Ukrainian future, of Ukrainian offensive actions. And I would say that on quite a few occasions, perhaps more often than not, his predictions of Ukrainian attacks or offensives simply failed to come true. I think he would do himself a great deal of credibility. He would enhance his own credibility if he stopped doing that and simply reported what had actually happened rather than attempting to second guess the thinking of the Ukrainian command. Anyway, that's all I wanted to say about that. But anyway, he has given a brief summary of what is now happening in the Bakhmut area, and I'm taking this from his own Twitter account now, or X account now, I should perhaps call it, and he says that from the direction of Rozdolivka, um, our sources from the field tell us, the Ukrainian military are trying to advance in small groups. We're talking about this locality to the north of the strike. This is again all in the Bakhmut area. They advance in small groups of two, three, four people. If in other areas there are at least ten, seven to ten of them, here three or five are trying to advance, but they are failing. Basically, they cover our positions with artillery and then try to take the squads forward. And this is becoming, by the way, the pattern of the offensive in most places. Ukraine fires artillery barrages, tries to soften Russian defences, um, and then, rather than send massed armour towards the Russian defences as the much talked about NATO combined arms tactics would suggest that they do, or engage in human wave tactics, as I've seen some people suggest. In other words, large, endless waves of soldiers advancing upon fortified positions, reminiscent of people's ideas of what happened in the First World War, places like the Pas Passchendaele and the Somme, to repeat, I don't think anything like that has ever happened to any extent uh, over the course of this war. And I don't think either side has engaged in tactics like that. 
Rather, what the Ukrainians do is they send small dispersed groups of infantry walking across the fields, scattered across the fields, often in great distances from each other, sending them towards the Russian positions, hoping that that way it will be more difficult for the Russians to destroy them through shelling attacks, but at the same time risking risking the probability that if by any chance these small groups do reach the Russian positions, they'll be isolated from each other and insufficiently strong to break through. And this has happened time and time again. And we see this happening, according to Rebar at least, in the Bakhmut area as well. And then he goes on to say, in the area south of the Berkovsky Reservoir, that's near that village of Berkovka, which um, Prigozhin claimed the Ukrainians had recaptured in June, and some people in the West continue to believe that the Ukrainians still capture, even though it is firmly under Russian control and has never been recaptured by Ukraine. But anyway, to go back to what Rebar is saying, in the area south of the Berkovsky Reservoir, there are no attempts to advance as there were before. Now it's completely stopped. Likewise, we see no attempts to advance in this section. If before, Ukrainians took active actions and tried to by bypass Bakhmut and take it in claws, half claws, that is no longer the case. So Ukraine has basically given up all of its attempts to try to break the Russian Franks to the north of Bakhmut, the town the Russians now call, but apparently not Riba, by the way, Arkhiomysk. And then he goes on to say, all Ukrainian activity is now basically centred on the triangle of Kleshevka, Andreevka, Kordyumovka, and Ozaryanivka. At Kleshevka, <coughs> The enemy, the enemy, he means the Ukrainians, attempted an offensive against our positions. They still hold certain key heights, but the Russian army has managed to capture seven soldiers, seven Ukrainian soldiers over the past night. And again, that gives us a sense of the true scale of the fighting. We're talking about small packets of infantry fighting each other, artillery on both sides, sometimes the individ individual tanks are brought out to support the infantry, but it's no, it's certainly not the kind of fighting we were seeing earlier on in the winter and the spring around Bakhmut. It's nothing like on that level of intensity anymore. And anyway, he then goes on to, to say, as for Kordyumovka, throughout the night tanks were traveling to these lines firing, he means Ukrainian attacks, firing at the locality from open, from closed and open firing positions, and everyone was waiting for the continuation of the counter-offensive and counter-attack by the Ukrainian forces on this unfortunate settlement. But after a counter-battery fight on our part, the enemy, he means the Ukrainians, were driven back. So it's not completely clear what he's telling us, but basically what he's saying, and it's in, it's in conformity with what I have seen from other reports, is that in the Bakhmut area, Ukrainian attempts to attack towards the north of Bakhmut, along the Berkovka Reservoir, and all of that have come to a stop to the extent that any fighting goes on in this area. It is confined to small groups of infantry fighting each other, no real sign of a Ukrainian breakthrough. Ukraine is still trying to break through to the south. They've not managed to capture Kleshevka. They still control a few of the heights around Kleshevka. Kleshevka is in an area of lower ground with higher ground around it. But it's important to stress again, we're not talking about peaks or mountains or hills. We're talking more about undulations in the landscape. Anyway, the Russians have pushed the Ukrainian back, Ukrainians back in some places and elsewhere.
where the Ukraine has been trying to launch attacks towards Kordyumovka, rather more sizable place than Klesheyevka. Well, even there, despite the use of tanks, and again, probably we're talking about two or three tanks at most, but even there, the Russian artillery came into action and the Ukrainians were driven back. So what one gets the sense of is of a very considerable reduction in the intensity of the fighting in the Bakhmut area. Now, there continues to be fighting in these perennial hotspots of the war, Avdevka, Marinka, Vugledar. I haven't had many reports about what's going on in these places. I doubt that anything very much has changed. The big news in terms of what is going on on the front lines continues to come from the Kupiansk area and from the area of the Oskol River. And the reports suggest that we've had some more Russian advances. And we are told that I spoke yesterday about how the Russians paused. They pushed back some Ukrainian attempts at counterattacks. It seems Russian forces near Kupiansk have now been reinforced. We're told that over the course of the last 24 hours, this is near Kupiansk itself, they've captured seven fortified positions and these fortified positions are close to this village of Sinkovka, which is very close to Kupiansk, and also to another place called Petro Pavlovka, presumably another village, also in this area. And there were reports that the Russian troops have actually um, are actually now preparing an attack on Pe Petro Pavlovka. And this is what the one report which I read on Sovyangrad, this is from a Russian source, That's, this is how it describes the fighting. It says, Russian armed forces advance on Kupiansk. Um, Russian troops continue to put pressure on, the, on Kupiansk on a broad front and slowly move forward, preparing an attack on its eastern suburb, Petro Pavlovka. And um, it seems that um, there is um, an attack on Petro Pavlovka about to take place. And this report refers to Petro Pavlovka as an actual suburb of Kupiansk itself, which strongly reinforces the impression I, can, I formed a few days ago that the Russians are indeed planning to storm the place. Now, let me reiterate again, there continues to be much talk in the West about the fighting being at a standstill, about Russian and Ukrainian forces being in a situation of stalemate, not longer much expectations that the Ukrainian offensive will be successful. This is not a stalemate. And if what is happening is far better understood as the Russians defeating an offensive, it is after all Ukraine that has launched this offensive. Ukraine is trying to gain territory it's not succeeding in doing so. It's capturing the odd village in place to place. So if Ukraine isn't able to break through, isn't able to achieve its objectives in this offensive, that is not a stalemate. That is a Ukrainian defeat. And in terms of what's going on in the north, on the northern front lines, it's not going to be a stalemate either. If Kupiansk is captured by the Russians, we're talking about a town of 25,000 people and with an area 
by the way, not far short of that of Bakhmut. I'm just saying, Bakhmut is bigger and had a much bigger population. But the total area of the two towns is roughly the same. And one which is apparently Kupiansk, one which is defended by a Ukrainian force, around 20,000 men, which is about the size of the of Ukraine's garrison in Bakhmut at the start of the battle for Bakhmut, which began in earnest in November last year. So, you know, if, if Kupiansk is captured by the Russians, if the Russians are able to drive the Ukrainians out of Kupiansk, and the Ukrainians, they may have a garrison in Kupiansk that is on the same size as the one in Bakhmut, they have the one they had in Bakhmut, but they don't have this large array of reserve forces around Kupiansk that they did in the case of Bakhmut. If the Russians capture Bakhmut, then they will definitely be making significant advances. And if they are able to push on towards Izium to the west, and perhaps even take that town, or as Boris Rogin, otherwise known as Colonel Kassad, speculated, if they push north towards Chuguyev, well, I think at that point it will no longer be possible, even for people in the west, to talk about a continuing stalemate. We will be looking at a situation where Ukraine is visibly losing the war. Now, one person has understood this and is prepared to take, on, take that on, head on. And that is Donald Trump's former national security advisor, George W. Bush's um, ambassador to the United Nations, one of the most hardline and, dare I say it, embittered hawks, neocons, call, out, call him whatever you like, in the U US system, who is John Bolton. And he's written, what I have to say comes across to me as a rather angry op-ed in the Wall Street Journal. And he openly admits that Ukraine is losing the war. He says that um, the Biden administration's policies are only delaying Ukraine's eventual defeat. This is essentially what his article appears to be saying. But of course, Bolton, <laughs> on this, by the way, he I sort of agree. But then, of course, Bolton, Bolton looks at this from a radically different perspective from the one I do, because he is essentially talking about a Ukrainian defeat, which is the result of the allegedly timorous lackluster policies of the Biden administration and of the president himself, of Joe Biden. And he makes comments like this, Ukraine's offensive failures and Russia's defensive successes share a common cause, the slow, faltering, non-strategic supply of military assistance by the West. The serial debates over whether to supply this or that weapon system the perpetual fear that Russia will escalate to war against the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and occasional Kremlin saber-rattling have instilled a paralyzing caution in Western capitals. Although the UK under Boris Johnson wasn't deterred, NATO has seemed unwilling to fulfill its commitment to restore Ukraine's full sovereignty and territorial integrity. The hesitancy is a product of successful deterrence by the Kremlin, not American strategic necessity. Far from being inevitable, the Ukrainians' inability to achieve major advances 
is the natural result of a US strategy aimed only at staving off Russian con conquest. And then he also uh, says that the West needs to rethink its sanctions strategy. He says the West, particularly Washington, also needs to rethink, rethink sanctions policy radically. Theories about price caps on Russian oil have failed. Well, again, on that, he and I agree. I've been saying that for ages, as have we, that is to say, Alex Christoforo and I on the Duran. It's nice to see John Bolton reach the same view. But anyway, theories about price caps on Russian oil have failed. Western sanctions generally remain piecemeal. That, about that, by the way, I would not agree. <laughs> and seriously unenforced. These defects aren't confined to the Ukrainian conflict and should prompt NATO institutionally to review how it conducts enforcement. Proclaiming sanctions is great PR, but enforcement is hard, tedious, and necessarily done clandestinely where possible. The US and its allies need a massive overhaul and upgrade of our sanctions enforcement instruments, procedures, and personnel. So this is Bolton's solution to the problem. Go on escalating, ignore the threat that the Russians aren't bluffing <laughs> and um, the possibility that nuclear war might result if the Russian nuclear arsenal isn't a bluff but is meant for real. So escalate, escalate to an unlimited extent, provide Ukraine with every type of weapon that Ukraine basically wants and aim for nothing short of total victory over Russia and do so moreover in a um, scenario of total economic war against Russia, an economic war that might involve the entire world, including, by the way, China, it's China as well. So sanctions on the Chinese, stopping of Russian ships, presumably, <laughs> across the world ocean. Um, every conceivable thing short of presumably a direct attack by NATO on Moscow itself. This is the only way that John Bolton can see the West, Ukraine, achieving victory over the Russians, the alternative is accepting a Ukrainian defeat. But at no point does Bolton perhaps take, one might almost be tempted to say, a more real realistic and certainly less risky approach, one that seems to involve less gambling than this approach does, an approach of negotiations, of serious talks with the Russians, of an approach to the Russians to try to find some way out of this colossal impasse that we have been led into and which has brought not just war to Europe, but tensions in Europe to a point of to a point which I, can, I simply cannot remember and which is undermining in the process the very foundations of the European economy and perhaps ultimately of the economy of the entire West. So don't negotiate even if you recognise that your present policy of support to Ukraine is failing it's only delaying Ukraine's eventual defeat. Go for broke instead. In fears of nuclear war, Armageddon, economic collapse, whatever, be damned. That's what you must do. I don't think that is an entirely unfair summary of Mr. Bolton's position. It's extraordinary, to my mind, that these sort of sentiments, all or nothing sentiments, 
are so freely expressed in the Western media nowadays. During the Cold War itself, they would have elicited strong responses within Western Western political systems, but they no longer seem to any longer. Bolton is able to make these astonishing demands for what the West should do, and he hardly gets answered. Of course, there is another way. I've discussed it already. I've already pointed out that there are alternative options to the kind of all-or-nothing gambling with John Bolton, gambling not just with the future of the West, but arguably with all of humanity that people like Bolton are urging on us. There is the far more realistic and coherent and rational options proposed by George Beebe and Jim Webb in their article in Time magazine, call off the offensive, Except the offensive isn't succeeding, that is weakening Ukraine, not strengthening it. Go over to the defence, buy yourself time, and talk. Talk with the Russians. Try, however hard it is, however angry the Russians by now are, and they are very angry, try to find some means to get the West and the United States and what's left of Ukraine after out of the hole that the West, the United States, and Ukraine have collectively dug themselves into. But that's not what people like Bolton want to see. And I have to say, for the moment, it is people like Bolton who, it seems to me, continue to get to set, if you like, the pattern of action. Not so far people like Webb and Beep. Anyway, that's where we are with Bolton. Now, I have to also point out one fundamental fallacy in John Bolton's whole line of argument, and it's one that is very typical of neocon thinking and neocon writing, though I would say that in Bolton's case, I think he's perhaps not so much an ideological neocon, but rather an American uber exceptionalist, even though he does share many neocon perspectives and um, positions. But anyway, note what he says about how it's all down to dithering. We're not providing Ukraine with the weapons that it needs. Ukraine's offensives, offensive failures and Russia's defensive successes share a common cause, the slow, faltering, non-strategic supply of military assistance by the West. The serial debates of whether to supply this or that weapon system um, um, and are entirely, as far as Bolton is concerned, a product of Western cowardice. Fear not to provoke the Kremlin. Well, it is not so. <laughs> I don't see that the West has been deterred, at least not this administration, have been deterred up to now by the Kremlin in any wep in terms of any weapon system that they've supplied to Ukraine. This, in fact, is a widespread criticism made in Russia of the Kremlin's policies. You often hear people within the Russian commentariat say, look, we're letting the West do whatever it wants. They're willing to, to cross their own lead lines. They're prepared to supply Ukraine with heavy weapons, with missiles, with um, rockets, with every kind of weapon system that the West wants to supply to Ukraine. We never respond. And all that is doing is that it's emboldening the West 
to go on supplying more and more and more. And there are also commentators in the West, like Colonel Douglas MacGregor, who think the same way, essentially, that this overcaution on Vladimir Putin's side, it always comes down to Vladimir Putin, the overcaution on Vladimir Putin's side is, in fact, almost inviting the West to escalate and that the Kremlin needs to take a harder line in order to deter escalation. So we could see how, again, Bolton is not really talking about it as it is. I have, cannot recall a single instance when the Russians have actually come out and said that they object to any particular weapon being supplied to Ukraine and when that has prevented that particular weapon from eventually being supplied. But anyway, to proceed, the limiting factor is not fear of the re reaction of the Kremlin. It is Western capabilities to supply these weapons. And Bolton, like neocons generally, simply refuses to acknowledge this. I've often said that one of the characteristic features of neocon thinking is that they do not acknowledge any limits to what the United States is able to do. A culture over decades to a conception of the United States as an unlimited power, one with unmatched resources, they assume that all the United States needs to do is to will an outcome for that outcome to be achieved, to will the means to that outcome, and the means will appear. Logistics, industrial production, industrial organization, training of workforces, supply chains, economic limitations, that sort of thing doesn't enter into their discussions at all. And you have it here with John Bolton. The real reason why the West doesn't send unlimited supplies of tanks, infantry, fighting vehicles, shells, drones, <laughs> aircraft, what have you, to Ukraine is because it doesn't have them, or if it does have them, it has them in relatively short supply, or if they do exist and are available in some quantity, it takes time, a lot of time, to train the Ukrainians to use all of these systems. That isn't part, as I said, of the thinking that Bolton and people like him have at all. And we had another example of this. Now the United States has come out. In fact, there's been official comments from the Pentagon about the state of artillery production in the United States. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I read in the Financial Times that the United States had successfully doubled production of 155 millimeter shells, that production of 155 millimeter shells in the United States was running at about 14 to 15,000 a month before the fighting began in February 2022 and that it has doubled and the Financial Times actually gave a figure of 30,000 rounds of artillery shells, 155 millimeter artillery shells being produced every month, which is of course double 15,000. And I assumed that that was the correct figure for the amount of artillery shells that the United States is in fact producing at the moment. 30,000 rounds of 155 millimeter shells a month. Except that that actually is not correct. Actual production of artillery shells, 155 millimeter artillery shells in the United States currently is not 30,000 rounds a month. It is 24,000 rounds a month significantly fewer. 24,000 rounds of 155 millimeter artillery shells uh, 
would probably get Ukraine through perhaps a week of fighting at current levels of use. Ukraine fires around 8,000 shells a day. Not all of those will be 155 millimeter shells. Some will be mortar rounds, heavy mortar rounds. Some will be tank shells. Some will be shells of old Soviet artillery. But whatever, 155 millimeter shells are the key round used by the West and Ukraine in this war. And the United States isn't remotely coming, producing sufficient numbers to keep up with those totals and with, with the totals that Ukraine needs. And they are planning, apparently, to increase production of artillery shells to 85,000 a month. But that will only happen in 2028, in five years' time. By which point, of course, one wonders how much of Ukraine will be left. Now, we don't have figures for Russian artillery shell production, but the consensus appears to be that it is running into the millions. So that gives us a sense, not millions a month, but millions a year. So that gives us a sense of the difference, but it also gives us a sense of the realities that Bolton is ignoring. So he doesn't look at the difficulties operating F-16 fighter jets in Ukraine. He doesn't look at the problems of sending these fighter jets up against Russia's increasingly powerful and increasingly sophisticated air defense system. He doesn't look at the size of the Russian Air Force and the fact that it is growing in size and capabilities. He doesn't look at any of these things. He doesn't look at Russian tank production. He doesn't compare it with the difficulties the West has experienced eking out tanks to send to Ukraine. The total number of Leopard 2s that Germany was able to send to Ukraine was just between 60 and 70, perhaps a bit more, but not vast quantities of Leopard 2s. Germany's no longer able to supply more of these Leopard 2s, so it's having to rely instead on Leopard 1s. They apparently have bought around 50 of these tanks from an arms dealer in Belgium, Leopard 1s. Tanks are not in con condition, so they've had to be refurbished. They use old optical sights out of date. Today, in battlefields, they might have to be updated, but perhaps there isn't the time to do that. The guns are lighter and smaller, 105 millimeter guns, as opposed to the 125 millimeter guns Russian tanks use. They're also rifled guns, as opposed to the smoothbore guns, with much higher velocities and penetration that the Russians use. And of course, the armor of the Leopard ones is very thin. Britain has supplied 14 Challenger 2 tanks. They've not been committed to the fighting. There are problems with these tanks as well. Britain only has a number 40 tanks of these tanks serving in its military. To all intents and purposes, it's run out of tanks that it can supply. But, you know, none of this worries Bolton at all. Bradley infantry fighting vehicles supplied burn on the steps. The United States has only been able to find relatively old versions of the Abrams tank to send to Ukraine. It too is difficult to operate on Ukrainian territory. Again, don't worry about that either. Just assume that if we are not supplying Ukraine with all the weapons it needs to win the war, that is not because of their are technical and logistical and infrastructural problems that make that impossible, just assume that it is due entirely to a lack of political will. And we can see, again, the trap the President, the President of the United States, Joe Biden, has walked into over Ukraine. 
He can't send enough weapons to Ukraine to change the outcome of the war. But whatever he does now, he's going to fa face criticism. He's going to face criticism from those like George B., Chip Webb, lots of others, the Council for Foreign Relations, people in the Pentagon who are saying he's done altogether too much. He's overinvested U.S. credibility and U.S. resources in this unwinnable war in Ukraine. So that he'll come under criticism from that wing of the political establishment. And he's also going to come under criticism from the Bolton neocon wing, who, on the contrary, will say that he, is, he has not done anywhere near enough. He's not willed the forces for Ukraine that it needs. He's stopped short of waging that all-round global economic war against the Russians, which is the only way to secure victory. So he's damned if he does, and he's damned if he doesn't, and this was the trap he walked into at the behest of his advisors because he didn't listen to the words of the other president. He once served Barack Obama, who was, of course, president of the United States when Joe Biden was vice president. Obama once, in an interview to The Atlantic, in 2016, warned that in Ukraine, Russia always would possess escalatory dominance. And that was the reality that the United States had to acknowledge and face, and which should influence US actions. Biden didn't listen, wasn't reading, didn't agree to Obama's views, and he now finds himself in the situation that he is in. There is a fine article on Larry Johnson's uh, website, Sona 21, about the United States needing a plan B. And of course, in a sense, this is exactly the point made by um, 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 Jim Webb and George Beebe um, in their article for Time magazine. And this article by Larry Johnson is not by Larry Johnson himself, it's by somebody who calls themselves Observer R. But it goes through the problems in coming up with a plan B. And it suggests that even the plan B, which the United States might come up with at this point, isn't going to work. And perhaps the more appropriate thing for the United States to do is to reverse course entirely and to focus on shoring up the international position of the dollar as the linchpin of the entire American system. Well, that, of course, is way out of what it is politically possible for the President Joe Biden to do. Anyway, there we are. I've discussed the situation on the battlefields. I've spoken about um, John Bolton's thinking, if that's the right word to describe his largely reflexive response to the gathering crisis in Ukraine. It's only true to say that yesterday was also a day of very heavy Russian cruise missile and drone attacks across Ukraine. And they continue. Same level of intensity as on other occasions. Once again, Odessa seems to have been very much the target of these attacks. And the Russians have taken a step yesterday 
I think more than anything else intended to show the earnestness of their position in terms of their determination to control shipping involving Ukraine in the Black Sea, a Russian warship, the Vasil Bikov, Vasily, the Vasil, Vasily Bikov stopped a um, freight ship from a third country, Palau. Um, the ship was boarded and apparently inspected by uh, Russian uh, marines, but apparently they were um, they accepted that there was no contraband, cargo, weapons, or that kind of thing, and the ship was allowed to steam on. And this was done, I suspect, more than anything else, as a show of resolve, to show that when the Russians talk about imposing a blockade, an embargo on Ukrainian ports, which is in effect what they have done, they mean what they say. And this is partly, I'm sure, a response to President Zelensky's attempts to encourage Western shippers to continue to go to Ukrainian ports. The Russians have just made that more difficult. Anyway, that's where we are. A deteriorating military picture for the West and for Ukraine in Ukraine itself on the battle lines and more fears and worries in the West about that but no coherent plan and a president increasingly immersed in legal problems and legal difficulties who is going to find his position who subjected to increasing criticism his position on Ukraine subjected increasing to increasing criticism both from the realists who think he has been too reckless and from the hardliners who think on the contrary that he has been too timorous too cowardly in confronting the kremlin and taking risks the level of which would once never have been contemplated by the West. Now, before I proceed, as two further topics which I'd just like to touch on briefly. One is the issue of the ruble. The ruble has now crossed the one hundred dollar to the uh, one hundred ruble to the dollar um, position. Um, this has again excited lots of commentaries in the West. The Financial Times is leading on the story. I have become very, very, um, shall we say, um, hardened now to discussions about the ruble. Let me repeat again. Once upon a time, a fall in the value of the ruble would have been a very, very serious thing for the Russian economy. In 1998, when the ruble collapsed, um, it caused hyperinflation in Russia and the complete collapse of the banking system. In the period directly after the 2008-2009 crisis, the ruble again fell sharply. Um, it lost something like two-thirds of its value. There was um, a massive attempt to try to shore it up by the Russian government, which was just about successful but they burned through something like 40% of their foreign currency reserves to do it. And the reason they had to do it was because had the ruble collapsed in 2008-2009, as it did in 1998, there would have been a comparable collapse of the financial system in Russia, and Russia would also have, again, fallen into a spiral of extremely high inflation. Now, the reason that was the case in those days was twofold. Firstly, the Russian financial system at that time did not, properly speaking, exist. There were banks in Russia, but they were totally integrated into the global financial system controlled by the West. Many of those banks had taken out loans or had established connections with Western financial institutions. 
which depended on the rouble having a certain value in order to remain effective. And those banks and financial institutions were, in many cases themselves, very heavily indebted to the West. In addition, at that time, lots of Western companies, Russian companies and businesses were in the habit of taking out loans from Western banks and financial institutions denominated in dollars and to some extent in euros. I should say that one Russian acquaintance of mine, it was his job. He was working for various big Russian companies at that time, and his job was to travel around the West, speak to the big Western banks, negotiate loans in dollars and Euro, euros for the Russian companies, the various Russian companies he was working for. The moment the ruble fell, it became the cost of these loans to Russian companies would become almost unbearable, and many of them would be driven into default and, of course, eventual collapse. Russia also, in those days, was extremely heavily dependent on imports of goods from the West. It imported food. People don't often know this, but um, before the 2008 crisis, before the 2014 crisis, Russia was a major food importer imported food from the West, paid for in dollars and in euros, and of course Russian companies, Russian businesses in Russia depended very, very heavily on European and American manufacturers, especially German manufacturers, but also Swedish, Italian, French, for imported subcomponents and machine tools to keep the Russian economy, especially the motor car industry functioning. Even aircraft, which of which, by the way, Russia produced an ever-diminishing number year by year, but even Russian-built aircraft, like, for example, the Suhoi Superjet, depended very heavily on Western avionics, Western technology, and... Um, components for their engines. They could not, to all intents and purposes, be produced without, imp without those imports. And if the ruble fell, the cost of those imports immediately rose, and either the imports became unaffordable, in which case the companies that depended on those imports would be forced to close or cease production, or in the alternative, it would be a cost that the Russian companies importing these products would have to pass on to the cons their consumers in Russia, which would lead to a rise in inflation. So one can see how, because of debt issues, financing issues, importation issues, the value of the ruble really did matter terribly to the position of the Russian economy. None of that applies anymore. And this is an essential thing to say from being a food importer. Russia has become self-sufficient in food and is now a food exporter. It is also, of course, self-sufficient in energy and is a major energy exporter. It no longer imports subcomponents from the West because sanctions have already made that impossible. And steps that the Russian government took after the 2008 crisis and even more after the 2014 crisis when the West first started imposing sanctions on Russia. Anyway, steps the Russians have taken has basically secured for the Russians alternative supply chains, both domestic and foreign, so that they no longer have to import these goods these components from the West. And of course, Russian banks have to all intents and purposes been cut off from the Western financial and banking system since the 2014 crisis. They no longer take out loans.
from Western banks and financial institutions. And so they're no longer going to run into a debt crisis because the ruble has lost value. So this is not the great crisis it once was. Back in 2022, when the ruble fell in value after the sanctions were first imposed, and for some months after, the combination of high interest rates and a collapse in imports, together with very high oil prices, meant that the ruble became very strong. And this started to cause concern on the part of the Russian government. It was felt that the very strong ruble was undermining Russia's export position. And nonetheless, my own view at that time was that in the e immediate aftermath of the sanctions, it probably made sense for the Russian government to allow the ruble to remain strong in order to consolidate the Russian economic position, to bolster confidence within Russia itself, and to bring inflation down, inflation having risen in Russia in March, April to around, well, some suggest might have hit levels of up to 20%. Today, the situation is completely different. The internal economy is stable. The financial system is functioning smoothly. Inflation is probably ticking around, around the 4% level. And in August, as it usually does in Russia at this time of year, it is largely falling. So the problem with the devaluation of the ruble that might have existed last year, this year no longer exists. However, <laughs> there are other factors, and I've discussed this before, which perhaps would have inclined the Russian authorities to look upon a fall in the value of the ruble as to some extent beneficial. The Russian budget was in deficit at the start of the year, large deficit at the start of the year, partly because the government was spending very heavily at that time. There was a need to get demand in the economy moving again after the collapse of demand within Russia that took place in the aftermath of the sanctions last year. Um, so monetary policy was loosened, budget policy was slack at the beginning of the year, all of that was successful. The economy took off. GDP growth in the second quarter was 4.6% above the admittedly depressed levels of the year before. Imports started to be sucked in. And in the meantime, oil prices, as is very well known, fell. And Russia had to spend time anyway adjusting to the fact that it's Customers for oil prices in the West had gone away. So, reducing the value of the ruble, eased monetary conditions within Russia. It also made Russian exports more competitive. It makes the earnings from Russia's oil and gas exports and by the way, it's food exports, higher. And we've already seen that the budget is now rapidly moving back to a position of balance. So from a Russian point of view, the depreciation, the Russian government's point of view, the depreciation of the ruble is serving its purpose. It is helping the domestic economy, and in particular the government's finances, adjust, can complete its adjustment to the period of sanctions that the country, Russia, has been subjected to.
Within the next few months, at some point in the next few months, we will almost certainly see the ruble start to harden, to strengthen again. And the reason will be that having loosened monetary policy, having engaged in a heavy spending program at the start of the year, principally to support demand, though also to some extent for the war, having um, allowed interest rates to fall, having kept production of oil and gas at a very high level in order to win over customers, the Russians are now taking steps to reverse all of these policies which led to the fall of the ruble. So monetary policy is tightening, budget policy is tightening, um, Russia's um, current account is strengthening, Russia's trade balance is also strengthening, we will see all of this eventually work its way through and we will probably see before the end of the year or perhaps at the start of next year, the ruble start to strengthen again. Now, the Russian Central Bank and Putin's key economic advisor, Maxim Oreshkin, say, are now saying that Russia has reached that point where the economic situation is basically stabilized. The adjustment to the sanctions period is coming to an end. They predict that inflation will fall back. They might indeed even revisit the inflation target and make it tighter. They expect monetary policy to become more conventional again and budget policy to become more conventional again. Both the central bank and Oreshkin are in agreement that growth rates will fall from the present 4 to 5% rate that we're seeing at the moment towards a steady annualised rate of around 2 to 2.5% 2 per year, whilst the full adjustment and rebuilding of the Russian economy takes place. And all of that will happen against the backdrop of a strengthening ruble. As I have said previously, and as I repeat once more, this policy of softening the ruble is one that the Russian government not only has welcomed, but I am confident in my own mind that they have partly engineered. Just as a strong ruble worked to their advantage last year, a weak ruble has worked to their advantage this year. Next year, it will be different, and we will probably see a stronger currency return. Now, I have discussed this issue ad infinitum. Every time, as I said, there's a fall of the ruble in the value of the ruble, despite People pay no attention to the internal inflation dynamics, the internal domestic activity of the economy. They pay little attention to that. They focus on the ruble. Every time the crisis is predicted, it fails to take shape. But hope, I suppose, <laughs> in the West springs eternal. We're just seeing this all happen once more, and I'm confident that we will see it all happen again, and that I will be having exactly the same conversation about the ruble, not just again in the future, but many times in the future once more. Well, thank you all for joining me again today. More from me soon. I hope that you all receive, you, 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 you'll remember that you can find our programs on our various platforms, Locals, Rumble, BitChute, Odyssey, Rockfin, and Telegram. You can also find, um, you can also support our work via Patreon and Subscribestar, links under this video. You can also check out our shop, and buy yourself the great things that you will find there, our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all those great things. And last but not least, remember, if you've liked this video, please press the like button and check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again.
more from me soon and have a very good day.